Welcome back to another episode of our hunting fitness series. Once again, joined by my friend Mike Barnes. If you, this is episode number two. If you missed episode number one, obviously we would recommend that you go back and click on this link up here that we'll provide, get you caught up on kind of where we're headed with everything. Today, Mike and I are going to sit down. We're going to talk a little bit about the weight room and we're going to talk about, uh, kind of seasonal preparations here. So we're going to get into some things we're going to talk about, you know, what should we be doing during specific times of the year, things that we should be focusing on? How do we start generating programming that works us kind of forward towards our September? You know, for us, you know, I kind of consider this to be a little bit of postseason. We do have some hunts that we're kind of hoping we're still going to get accomplished, maybe more with the rifle in our hand, but kind of postseason in terms of archery. So um, I want to kind of kick things off. Number one, Mike, how are we doing today? I'm great, Coach. How are you? Good. Hopefully you are uh, invigorated and, and ready to uh, stimulate the mind and, and uh, drop some knowledge bombs today. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, pretty pretty good topic i think especially given the time of year to kind of look at like how do we start thinking about next year right like uh, i mentioned in either conversation or, or in our previous podcast you know the day after archery season ended here in colorado put a post out said 330 days and 10 hours and whatever until next season and with that comes kind of how we start planning a little bit and so i kind of want to start digging into this talk to you a little bit about kind of your approach uh i'll talk a little bit about you know kind of filling in on on things that i think i i think about when we get into uh, specific times a year and and talk about how we can improve people's ability to kind of plan for what their strength program should look like obviously we're going to talk about conditioning in a future episode uh get into a little bit more of that some specifics you and i were just talking on online or offline a little bit about uh you know, general stuff to specific stuff. And I think that's going to play into our conversation as well. So talk about postseason. Uh, postseason, I think, is where a lot of people start going, all right, I learned some things on the mountain or, you know, I, I felt like this worked out good in terms of either how I felt or performed. And now we start kind of getting into, all right, how do we start putting the pieces together? So, you know, where's your starting point, I guess, would be a good place to, to begin with as, as you start kind of sorting things out in terms of, of our weight room work. Well, in, in my, my season, hunting season, where I'm really kind of dialed in is, is the month of September. So as soon as that month's over, um, I start thinking about, okay, what does the next phase go? And that, you know, as a, whatever strength conditioning coach, we call that to the transition period. So we're going to transition from our off season and then we're going to transition into the in well, not in season, but kind of um, preparatory season. So it, it starts October, October 1st. And what I'm trying to do is kind of, like you said, take that inventory, um, you know, where you are physically, or I guess, you know, where I am physically, it was, was to your question. So, it's, it's, you know, I'm going to start moving around again and start, you know, your components of your training program, which will include some type of mobility, flexibility. We'll pair those together, neuromuscular strength and endurance, um, get cardiovascular kind of back where you wanted to do. And, and truly, I just want to kind of recover. So it's kind of a moderate to lower volume of, of uh, training with moderate to, to lower intensities. Frequency, I'll be training five times a week typically, maybe four to kind of get back into it. And then once I'm through October, I start into November and then I'm starting to hit the weights and work some strength training, which I enjoy to do. Um, I never really get away from cardiovascular training, but we're going to focus on strength training at this point. So during November, um, and then I'm going to call it through the winter. Um, it's, it's not exclusively uh, strength training, but it's kind of strength training uh, focused. And then I'll start like the weather starts nice, get out the mountain bike, um, you know, and I've been, you know, whatever, doing cardio in the gym for the most part through those months. And in Colorado, it's cold and sometimes it gets warm and it's great to take out the road bike or else get a hike in where there's when there's no snow. 
Um, right. So that's that the thing that's right in front of me is going to be October and kind of that transition phase, which we've just started. So it is it's the beginning of October right now. So that's kind of what I'm doing is starting to get back into it. And then coming off, there's so much energy that I typically expend. And I know you too. Um, and we want to, it's like, I got to save some of my um, energy for, for, you know, for the hiking and the, the intense physical efforts of the in-season stuff. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think you know, a lot of times I, I look back at kind of how we approach sport preparation a lot of times, right? Which is when the season ends, right? In, in sport, just like the same as it is for us in, in the archery season. And you've done a ton of work, you've done all this preparation, you've done the lifting, and you've done whether it's running, biking, rowing, whatever, you know, in terms of, of metabolic conditioning. And then you go out and in the month of September, depending upon how fortunate or, or how lenient you are in, in terms of your time to get out into the woods. Typically, when we get through the month of September, a lot of times we're pretty smoked, right? We're tired, we're a little bit physically exhausted, we're mentally yeah. exhausted. And I, I, a lot of times will tell someone, Hey, once we get through that period, you know, take a break, get, get yourself away from, you know, maybe anything or everything, do some non-structured stuff for, you know, as much as two or even three weeks where I, I don't necessarily need you to turn around and go like crank it right back up. Right. Um, yes. and be, that gives you it, cause otherwise, you know, you kind of lock yourself into, not really having any downtime, not allowing your body to kind of get back to neutral. And that that's kind of an important piece as you look at, at you know, your planning, I think early on is as soon as the season's over. Do you agree? 100%. Yep. I, that's exactly yeah. what that approach is. Yeah. So, you know, and then as you said, as we start to get back into it, you know, maybe it's, you know, three to four days a week, depending upon your training level, maybe it's four to five days a week. I know a lot of people will go as far as, as getting up to, you know, six days a week. And, and some people say, oh, I'm going to do something every single day. And a lot of times I'm, I'm a fan of kind of like slow rolling your way back into it, kind of building a little bit of a, a thirst or desire to want to want to crank it back up right and, right. and have have some uh y you know a little bit of urgency or, or antsiness like man i i'm a, i really want to try and get better i want to try and improve i want to you know <laughs> cr crank it back up and i think that when you feed or fuel that fire a little bit uh, a lot of times our intent behind our training improves a little bit as well right well, you know, the other thing too, Joel, is not only the frequency of training, but also the nature of the workouts. So how fatiguing are they? If, you, if you're going to do, look, I'm going to do a, a, whatever, a half hour walk on the mm -hmm. treadmill, push, pull, squat, a little flexibility. I want to knock out that workout in an hour. Um, you know, you might even be a really a low level uh, cardiovascular effort, which is okay. Right. Whatever, just say walking on an incline at three and a half miles an hour, incline between say I don't know, whatever, correct, but between three and nine, 10 degrees, that's pretty comfortable for, for most people, um, especially if you're used to hiking mountains. So mm -hmm. that's not a real fatiguing workout, but you know, you want a fatiguing workout, then it's probably not the best time to do it, especially in October, if you're coming off of, you know, a seasonal hunt like September. Right, for sure. And I think you you briefly mentioned it too. I, I think that maybe the other portion of your postseason also begins with doing a little bit of, of evaluation, right? Like Absolutely. What, what what were things that, you know, are the most challenging? I know for me this year, if you paid attention to our page, you know, I, I went through and documented a death hike that we did with the guys from Ivy holsters. We did, you know, That's 40, right. mi 40 miles in, you know, a day and a half. And, and it was an absolute butt kicker, but I turned around and I specifically recall in September being in the woods and we had, you know, I think day two of our hunt, we were out like 13 hours, you know, we pushed close to 10 miles. And, you know, I thought to myself like, Oh my gosh, like, man, I am, gassed and you start to take into consideration things like 
climbing over deadfall and being off trail and all of these things that ultimately require so much more in terms of output physically than in con you know converse to that of doing that 40 mile hike which was 100 percent on trail yes it was tough yes we had packs on yes we covered a lot of ground but guess what i didn't step up and over any trees i didn't you know do yeah. th that you know bushwhacking and all that stuff and you go wow that's a different animal right and so i think those yeah. are things that as you evaluate when you go through what your training should look like it's like is it a mobility issue right you mentioned like focusing on mobility i'm a huge fan of you know working on hip mobility working on ankle mobility you know even some components of some balance right i mean i don't know how many times we're we're climbing up and over and on things and there's there's some you know places that we went where you're literally leapfrogging and, and hopscotch and on trees and and things like that where you're not even touching the ground so do you put yeah. any emphasis towards those things within your programming as well especially specifically talking about you know our hunt prep well yes specifically mobility and flexibility um different ways i like to manage it and you know here's here's part of the problem is if you've got an hour to work out you're going to use that whole hour you're probably not going to do any flexibility so you know, when I work one-on-one -on -one or else I you do any exercise prescription, I always include it. So they're forced to do that. But if someone has, you know, whatever, they want to go for a trail run, they're going to trail run and then they're not going to do any of that flexibility. So what I'll say is I give them a, I give them a home program as well. And, be, and I'll tell them like, look, I don't care if this is a cold stretch. First thing in the morning, last thing in the evening, just take it easy and just wiggle around. There is no wrong way to do this. Um, quads, backs, hamstrings, hip flexors, um, you know, whatever those areas are that you're going to focus on. That's probably it. Torso, some shoulder stuff as well. That's all good and well. Here's whatever, just say five to 10 flexibility, mobility type exercises. Do that. Um, I, the other thing is that I would mention too, if you are hiking and you're under load, significant load, just I would say 35 pounds or more, and you get to the point where, okay, my hip flexor is really starting to bother me or in it, it's affecting my gait. Stop, take off your pack, sit down, go through a series of stretches, get that thing to calm back, to calm down, as opposed to just kind of pushing through. Oh, I only got whatever, half mile or a mile left. I'm going to keep on grinding. It's just, it's going to continue to get worse. So stop during the middle of that hike and, yeah. and take some time out. Do you do that, Joel? Oh, a hundred percent. Uh, I had numerous times this year where we took our packs off, we stopped, we grab a snack or whatever else. And yep. I'll put my foot up on a log and go into a hip flexor stretch or, you know, kind of move things around and, and that type of stuff. Because I, as you said, right, like if you just say, ah, well, this is going to suck and it's just going to keep getting worse or, or, you know, yep. it's going to, it's going to nag me for the rest of the day. Guess what? You're going to put that pack back on, you're going to keep hiking. And the best thing you can do is try to address it. Right. So there's a lot of things that we do, uh, even day to day in the hunt, right. I bring a golf ball that I, I, I have in our, you know, one of our totes or something like that, or potentially even throw in my bag, depending on whether or not we're base camping or spiking or whatever, and work through mother the footbed, right? And, you know, your foot's going to take a beating yeah. as you're as you're out trouncing around. Uh, we bring a breath belt to try and help, you know, with diaphragmatic breathing and resetting because you're putting so much compression with that pack on all day, trying to release that QL a little bit and give that that low back a little bit of of uh, stress relief and and just things like that that I think all of that especially on the mobility side the flexibility side and and you know for all for all intents and purposes the weight room as well is this stuff is like compounding interest right and when i think yep. about how 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 these things are in the long play right you're asking to just uh, we call it like going out and touching the wall right like make sure we go out and touch the wall routinely and, and that means that we're just going to always make sure that there's a focus there to those things because as you go day to day week to week month to month whether that's you know in in a hunt specific you know scenario or in your overall training you know yearly those are the things that over time are going to make a big difference. 
Yeah. Well, I, I guess to kind of circle back on that too is the if you have an area that needs to be addressed after you assessed your season, orthopedically, back, knee, shoulders, um, you know, low back, hip flexors, whatever it is, address that first and try to mitigate that and manage that initially. So that can be something that you can do, especially if it's, um, you know, you've got some pain around those areas too. So one of the things that I did want to mention the one of my buddies I was hiking with and hunting with, um, you know, his knee started to swell up and I'm thinking to myself, mm, boy, I really wish you had a little bit more preparation or I knew about this prior to the hunt because it's like once that knee starts swelling, it's tough to manage if you know that you have significant sure. distances to cover the following day. Yeah. So in my mind, it was like, dude, I know you're doing everything you can, but yeah, if you weren't progressing over time and you gave me three months and terminal extension at the knee and the VMO, it looks like that was kind of an issue. Now you're running into some tracking problems potentially and not to say your hunt's over, but this isn't walking, you know, whatever, it's 300 limited. miles. Right. It's, it's totally limited. And yeah, you know, you get to that next base and you're like, I want to go see it. And you're like, well, his knee can't do it. So, you know, you don't yeah. want to make someone feel stupid, but you know that they yeah. just can't handle it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we ran into the, to a similar issue, you know, Jason has some meniscus problems and, you know, we went through yeah. some pretty gnarly country for about two and a half days and the downhill, the eccentric portion and things like that. Like he just, you know, he, he started to struggle and, and it affected our hunt. And ultimately it, it kind of ended our hunt short and, I always say yeah. that when you when you look at at things like that, whether you know his is a little bit more orthopedically kind of uh, you know related, where it's like he probably needs to go and and get a cleanup done and and get that thing back yeah. into you know a, a better position where he can start putting some work back in. He's been kind of disgruntled. He's been down in the weight room already trying to to do some things because I think he was really disappointed. But guess what, like it's not going to go away. And yeah. in your, in your, in your buddy's case, right? Like whether it's, you know, that or the other, which is lack of preparation or whatever. I typically say, if you're going to go out and hunt with one or two or three or however many of your buddies, you're always going to be limited to your lowest common denominator. Yep. Yeah. Right. And so you could be in the best shape in the world. And unless you're, you know, you guys are all heading out and just saying like, oh, I'm going this way, you go that way. I'll meet you back here later. <laughs> Um, that type of thing, which is perfectly fine. Uh, that's not, not my style of hunting. I, I, I like to hunt in pairs or, or things like that because it gives us a Same. better opportunity, I think, from a, a calling perspective and, and stuff like that to try and set yourself up in better positions to, you know, hopefully be successful. But um, that's definitely something that you have to think about, right? And I think there's some ownership individually that you have to take when it comes to that. And you say, hey, like, if I let down my buddy and we can't cover ground or, you know, my preparation wasn't there or whatever else, then I'm not only screwing myself, I'm kind of screwing him too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah, that's not, that, that's not, a, that's not a slight to Jason. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, uh, well, you know, but, yeah. if, if he's going to, if he needs to have that thing looked at, do it now. Don't wait until yeah. next summer going, okay, let's see what happens. Cause if there's going to be any setback now, he's just run himself right up to September going, geez, right. I hope I get it back. So, that's oh, yeah, that's that, you know when we're around sports too, and as you know, if someone has a an orthopedic issue, get it done now. And I still just scratch my head. With, look at these NFL guys that are waiting till spring in summer to get an orthopedic issue. Look, do that right after the season. Take care of it now, buddy. I don't I don't know who's giving you medical advice, but if you need to have something taken care of, do it immediately after the season. Don't wait. Yeah. For sure, because, you know, the longer ramp that you give yourself to get back to or oh, in, a, in yeah. a lot of cases, I, I tell people, especially as they go through these things, right, we see it with shoulders, we see it with backs, we see it with, with knees and things like that. And I say, your mission shouldn't be to get back to where you were. It should be to actually get to a better position than where you were. Otherwise, you put yourself right back in, in a similar situation to just end up, right. you know, having more issues. So there's definitely a lot to go on there. Um let, let's let's kind of transition a little bit and talk you know we've went through a little bit of, of off season we've addressed some things we've looked at you know 
mobility. We've looked at, at adding in some flexibility stuff. We're kind of gradually working our way back up to speed, um, you know, from some non-specific things. And now it's like, all right, I'm kind of in a groove, right? And things are starting to kind of come back. I, I've regained a little bit, maybe, you know, depending upon how much you beat yourself up over the past few months. What's your, your, you know, the beginning of kind of what I consider to be that like a bulk of your training that like off season, off season, typically you're looking at, you know, the winter months and, and as you start kind of working your way towards spring, and then that's kind of what I consider to be where, you know, our preseason prep starts. So what's, what's off season look like? Let's talk, you know, what's your sets and reps and, and how are you kind of breaking up the week and that type of thing in, in terms of what you're attacking? Um, so you just want to focus on kind of the winter months or you want to go transition into spring or do you want to uh, be like, 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 like winter months, you know, during the winter months as you're kind of building some strength, you're looking at, you know, increasing yeah. a little bit of maybe your capacities and those types of things, like kind of that, you know, three to four months of, of winter. Yeah. I like to cycle through. So I'll typically use just like blocks and um, there's a, there's a couple researchers out there that block periodization so if it's going to be through November or December or January or February, I'm using those specifically to improve muscle endurance, improve strength and improve power, power type movements, um, and then cycle back around too, right? So if I wanted to push just kind of my, it doesn't matter me or anybody else, that's what I would recommend is let's take this, you know, piece by piece in, even though like, for instance, uh, you know, I'm working with a competitive individual athletic background. And so he wants to work on his bench press and, and that's fine, whatever. But he's he told me and he, he made a point. He goes like, Mike, I really want to rebuild my bench press, for instance. All right. So we're going to rebuild his bench press flexibility, his lifting technique, bar speed. Uh, the mechanics of the movement have all changed. And he said to me just just a few days ago, he was like, it doesn't feel like I'm just muscling my way through these reps anymore. Um, we changed the bar path quite a bit and the bar speed quite a bit. He's not used to keeping a couple reps in reserve, um, which we know as exercise science kind of guys, it's like, look, you don't continually train to failure. And right. he had done that for years and years. He's got a respectable look. It's buddy, you're strong. But if you really want to work on this, I think you've got whatever, another 10 to 15% that's untapped just because mechanically you're not used to doing this, um, you know, with the most efficient way. So yeah. all that said, the block periodization model will work real well. Um, and I think that also, you know, as, as someone that, if, if you're working out, it's like, you know what, I'm going to do this for a month and I'm going to push right up until January. And then I'm going to phase back into maybe more of a, a lower rest, higher rep, a lot of variety. I got reps and set ranges, um, maybe try to tighten up the diet a little bit, put on a little bit of muscle, measure my body comp, keep track of my body weight. Good. And then I'll make another push through January and then into February, you can set yourself up to maybe some more some strength power gains in some specific movements as well. Maybe throw in some med balls, um, step up, step up, jump, jump squats, split split squat jumps. Um, yeah, so put all those things together in blocks and phases. Yeah, and and those blocks for you are those typically you know like four week, six week blocks. You know, you you know the model, <laughs> but it's. It's three weeks of a ramp up and then one week of a ramp down. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of the that's kind of the the model um, from a from a physiological point of view. That is right. is kind of the kind of the code that we use yeah. as strength and conditioning professionals. So I yeah. guess if I could just back up a little bit, it's not always three or four sets of ten. Um, there's nothing magic about the number ten. Um, so. Yeah. So we we would work multiple sets, different sets, reps, intensities, rest intervals, and then uh, build up for three weeks and then pull back for one. Right. And so and I think and the reason I ask that is just for clarity's sake. So if you're listening and you're like, all right, well, what's a block? Right. Like, what, what does yeah. that look like? Is that a day? Is that a week or whatever? And, you know, when we look at programming and, and as Mike said, you're you're looking at what 
kind of periods of time it requires for us to create some adaptation, right? So there's things that we call progressive overload, which is building up an ability to handle a specific either workload, to handle a specific um, actual load in itself, which is the amount of weight that you're lifting, right? Um, everybody has friends and people or maybe even guilty of it themselves where you walk in and you're like, oh, okay, today is, you know, Monday's coming up. It's international bench day. And guess what? I'm going to do three sets of 10 on bench. And you've been doing the same weight at three sets of 10 forever. Well, guess what? There's, there's staleness that happens from that. There's no gain that will continue to accrue at some point. And so these blocks are created so that, you know, it's three sets of 10 for a couple of weeks that then turns into four sets of eight, where the amount of weight that you lift is going to go up. And we're trying to build qualities, right? Strength and, and potentially endurance, right? So you don't just start out by saying like, ah, let's do sets of 15 when we don't have any capacity to do that, um, albeit that the, the load may be lighter. So th those are things that like start to fall into place as we start thinking about like, how do we create a roadmap here of where do we start and how are we going to build up to this? The one question that I had for you was, you know, you mentioned strength, you mentioned power, you mentioned endurance, which one do you like, you know, if we take those in terms of those blocks. So if we look at, you know, that, like you said, about a four week block, um, that, that fourth week is essentially kind of what we call like a deload or an unloading week where, yeah. um, you're trying to allow the body to recoup a little bit, right? And I always say our programming should not look like peaks and valleys. Our programming should look like ripples in the pond where we're going to build them up. We're going to create some yeah. stimulus. We're going to give them a little bit of rest, and then we're going to go about it again and a little bit of rest. And that's how those blocks are created. But my question to you is, um, as you mentioned those different uh, kind of areas to focus on, I think it's important to also talk about like prioritization, right? Like one begets the other type thing. Like where, which, which one of those blocks do you start with? Is it endurance? Is it strength? Or is it, you know, just because I think it's important for people to understand, like you don't just jump into the deep end and go like, sweet, we're going to go right to power movements right out of the gate. Um, wh where do you yeah. start in terms of like block one is, is, is it strength? Is it block one endurance? And then, you know, kind of just talk through how those progress. Well, it's, it's endurance first, and then it goes to strength, and then it goes to power, as, as you know, but you're giving me a softball there, too. Intentionally. Um, yeah, and that's, yeah, intentionally, but that's, that's good to know if, you know, someone is curious. So higher repetitions, moderate repetitions, lower repetitions, bar speed is going to be important across all those things. Um, kind of the nuance on how you lift that weight. And, and I would add to Joel and I are just not making this stuff up. So if someone wanted to fact check, there's uh, two brothers, European biochemists named Viru, V-I-R-O, uh, Viru and Viru. The, uh, there's a book on biochemistry and they kind of figured out that that block periodization over the course of a month was kind of your body's natural cycle. So that's, that's right. where we pull that block periodization. And the two guys, Bondarchuk and Insurin are two um, exercise science research PhD, both European coincidentally that kind of advocate for that block periodization. It, it yeah. works great, not only for us as hunters, but also, uh, in the tactical setting, it works real well too. And, and, you know, depending on whatever your sport is, that's right. That, that has a lot of application. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, if you look, we'll provide that stuff as we mentioned, right? Like, going towards an uh, objective kind of nature of how we want to try and deliver this stuff. It's, you know, this isn't Mike just saying, or me just saying like, Oh, like this is what you should do. It's no, these are the things that we've actually sought out to try and figure out like what has been proven in terms of how those adaptations are most effectively sought out and then achieved. Right. And, you know, this stuff has been vetted through uh, the paces within white paper research and those types of things. And that's, that's our mission here, right? Like we, we want to dive down into getting you a better understanding of what that looks like, how this stuff applies. Right. And then give you this so that you can start, you know, kind of, I think, ultimately I look at it and say, is this what you're currently doing? Right. If you're listening now and you're like looking at it going like, what the heck are these guys talking about? Well, we're trying to paint my numbers, this thing, in, you know, into your court and say, 
Is this how you're approaching it? Now, granted, there's a lot of ways you can skin a cat, right? There's a lot of different programming strategies and things like that. Um, we want to try and make sure that that it's just giving you some more fuel for your fire and evaluate the way that you're training. Obviously, we're going to come back and provide you with examples and things like that, um, programs and, and stuff that are, uh, you know, we'll have either whether it's on our website or whatever that, you know, you could just download and, and take off and go and take all the, the thinking work out of it. But, um, that, that's where we want to head with this thing. So now we've, we've kind of went through that, right. Um, you start with the endurance, you move towards strength next, I assume. Right. Um, so you're having a three, you know, a, the next block is going to be a strength phase. What's your, you know, what's our sets and reps and things like that look like in our strength phase? Well, just kind of for the, the basic movements, um, let's just say bench squat, um, some type of pulling action, pull-ups, pull-downs, deadlifts. Uh, the set rep range is going to vary as low as maybe four reps and as high as maybe eight. Um, I'd stay in that range. And also the nuance of the mechanics of the movements, having as really good as technique as you possibly have as an individual and how fast, how fast that bar is moving is going to set up for that power range and and the intensities will vary though too so right um i don't know it might go it might go as you know like an 8rm which would be a repetition max is going to be somewhere around 75 percent 80 percent but even then you might okay if i'm going to take someone to say 80 percent i might have only have them do say four reps i can do a couple more reps no because now you're starting to just work more of an endurance component and the way those um motor units and, and fibers are recruited on a, on a repetition max is going to be a lot different as opposed to let's just take this for four reps, even though you could do it for a six. So keep a couple reps in reserve. And you probably do this too, Joel, is I'll see someone perform a set and I'll stop them right there. It doesn't matter if they hit my target repetition. I just want to make sure that bar is moving fast enough. Sets over mechanically, you're breaking down or else the bar is not moving fast enough, which is mechanics mm. as well. But that 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 statement in itself opens a massive can of worms. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Where, where, when you look yeah. at that, you know, you and I have talked about this uh, probably at nauseum, which is you know some of the pitfalls we see in some of these like we'll call it high intensity training. <laughs> um, yeah. And and you see that in itself becoming probably the biggest limiting factor in. Number one, training to exhaustion all the time. Yep. Number two, number two is you are putting yourself in a position where as soon as the technical aspect of the lift starts breaking down, um, you're not going to see the same type of benefit from that exercise. And number three, as soon as that technical aspect of the lift starts breaking down, the window of opportunity for injury is going to start drastically going up. Yeah, not only acute injury, but chronic injury as well. Exactly. Right. So um, I always use a term or kind of a, a coin, a, a, a phrase that I say, you know, you should you should really I always try to focus on the three P's position, posture, perform. Right. Which is putting a an individual in the right position to start with right understanding like what we are going to do with any given exercise, make sure that we're emphasizing the correct posture posture could be you know kind of asterisks with technique or or whatever that looks like right and then once we get them to that po that point now we can perform and performance can be anything right it could be at specific speeds it could be you know for whatever uh it, that that you know, is the given intent of an exercise. So uh, I'm, I'm huge on that. Like you said, if I see that stuff break down, guess what? We're going to either sets over. Back, sets over, we're going to back off the weight, whatever that looks like, right? Like, you know, I'm not into the bro lifting thing where it's like, oh, like, yeah, just do two more. I'll force a couple more out. Like, you know, Honestly. any anytime we put someone in a position where they could get injured in a training session, to me, that is either the fault of the individual, which of course is their, that individual mm -hmm. doing the exercise, or if they're in front of a coach, it is a hundred percent the coach's fault in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. It sure is. Right. 
So, um, yeah, I mean, that's awesome. And then, you know, as we go through starting out, like building up a little bit of resiliency, right, with that endurance in that first block, we move on, we get into some strength, right? Um, talk about power. Not only do I want to talk about power, I want you to talk about how power might be uh, translated, right? Because I think some people might listen to say like, well, what do I, I'm not an offensive lineman. What do I need power for in the back country, right? Like uh, talk right. about how, how that actually translates the biggest thing to me is like all of these things sound great in theory but the 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 take-home point of all this stuff is how does it translate to something that i want to be able to do in this case obviously we're talking about getting into the backcountry performing at a better level right and being able to do it um at a higher ability Right. So um I guess from a neuromuscular point of view, and if we talk about power, it's you're talking about speed strength. So you have some strength and now I want to move quickly. Um a box jump is pretty much everyone's familiar with a box jump, but that would be an expression of power, neuromuscular power. But in the backcountry too, and if you look at the dynamics of hiking, those contractions are happening fairly quickly. Um, you know, let's say quads, hamstrings, glutes. So if you want to go up a mountain and you want to get there quickly, um, which, you know, typically you want to do, you don't want to like take a lot of time getting from point A to point B, especially if you know that some place is not very productive. Um, you want to get there quickly. And I remember a couple of years ago, there was some, I was trying to cut off some elk at a saddle and I'm thinking, okay, they're over there 300 yards away. And I'm over here at whatever, a hundred yards away, this is going to, and they're just kind of casually moving. I mean, they're moving, but it wasn't, they, they weren't running away. It was like, man, I got to get up there. And I'm probably on a, I don't know, 20 degree incline, not super steep, but stupid, steep enough. Right. Good Lord. I, I was like, man, I just drained the tank to get here. And they're just kind of grazing along. So that would be an expression of power too. And, and yeah. it's nice to know. And if you have what, you know, just kind of, you know, kind of a general term is if I got the horsepower to get there, I, I want to get there fairly quickly too. But if you're right. constantly training um, incorrectly, you won't have that power component. Yeah. And, and how do we train that in the weight room? It's going to be some type of medicine ball, some type of squat, split squat, jump. Um, you might want to do some plyometrics. I like to control a lot for those, um, you know, I'll use kind of a hybrid plyometric type movement. Um, I'm going to move quickly especially for the lower body, um, but it's going to be safe and under control. So I'll have people yeah. kind of do this hybrid type plyometric um, so they don't have to do like a full on sports performance type plyo. I'm sure yeah, you do 100%. the same thing too. So I'm using With bands, I'm using bars. Yeah. Accommodate yeah. A little bit. yeah. Well, and I, you know, a couple things resonate with me on that, which is I, talk about this a lot, especially in the tactical setting where I work with, you know, first responders and military and things like that. And ultimately we'll talk about power training, which plyometrics or jump training, if you will. And you'll have people that are, you know, they're, they're our age or some older and, and whatnot. And they'll say like, man, I'm, I'm not a jumper. I don't, you know, I, I've never, I've never yeah. jumped or like, I'm old. I don't need to jump. Right. And I typically follow that up and I say like, well, yeah, you're probably right. And, but here's the thing, right. Uh, in the tactical setting to take law enforcement, for example, one of their kind of markers that they have to do is within their testing is they need to be able to get onto a six foot wall and they have to scale that wall, get off of it and, and go on to somewhere else. And I say, is getting on the wall the hard part? And most of them say like, no, I say it's getting off the wall, which means that yeah. we have to come off of that. We have to take that impact of landing, right? Without falling apart. So we talk yeah. about power and what that does is as you were talking, the thing that came to my mind was like, how many times did I actually, you know, in that deadfall situation, did I come off of a log and I actually had to like, you know, really come down off of a log and, you know, land on the ground. And guess what? We focus so much in training on the gas pedal and the gas pedal is typically not where people get hurt. It is the brake pedal. Yeah. It, it, it is the eccentric portion. It's the deceleration. It's the landing off of a log, that type of stuff coming down off of things where things fall apart. So to your point, when you talk about power, I say, there's a lot of 
small windows of opportunity, you know, jumping over a crick, right? Like there's multiple times where I'm like, eh, we're trying to find a place here. And guess what? That last three feet, I'm going to like, you know, jump up and over that thing or, or, you know, kind of broad jump my way uh, across that. And guess what? Those are, those are instances where if I've got a little bit more juice behind that, it's going to make that, that activity a little bit better. And more importantly, because I've done some preparation in the, in the power realm that my landing, my ability to control that load, that deceleration coming off of whatever that looks like is going to be much better or potentially much safer because I've actually prepped for that a little bit. Yep. Great point and great examples. Yeah. So, um, all right, well now, right. We've built up some capacity. We've started to get some strength. We've incorporated a little bit of power training. Now we start transitioning. We say like, okay, it's uh preseason time, right? We start getting antsy. The, the sun starts coming out. It starts warming up a little bit. And now we can, now that, that, kind of September 1st is lingering near, near to us. And we start getting some urgency, right? How do we start making that transition? What's your training look like as you kind of have, you know, we set the foundation, right? That kind of off season three, four blocks in, in those winter months kind of sets the table for really starting to kind of ramp it up. Granted, we know the conditioning portion. We're going to talk a little bit more specifically about that in another episode, but from a weight room perspective, how does that start transitioning as we get into that preseason? You know what, Joel? I'm just going to break you right there real quick. Let's back up and just talk real quick about how much um, power training should be incorporated. So your workouts all of a sudden just don't jump into this big, you know, we, I got 10 exercises of all power sure. to do, right? So, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. if you're going to incorporate this to your point about progressions, we're going to take one, maybe two exercises and incorporate incorporate those into our strength routine. Um, so if you have right. a block, whatever, just pick your month of in March, where you're, I'm going to this. We're going to use this as a power month. I'm still going to do a lot of those exercises. I might drop out one, I'll grab a leg press, easy to pick on. We're not going to do leg press anymore. I'm going to incorporate box jumps and squats. And I'm going to do this conjugated routine where I'm going to do both of those back and forth. Perfect. Don't do anything more than that. Um, be, the nature of power exercises is a lot different mechanically and stress on your body. So take, take time to incorporate those exercises. And if we had to pick a number, you and I, we would probably say, I want to build that up to about 30% of my overall exercises. My third week of this block is going to be power training. Everything else, that 70% is going to stay with strength. All that yeah. said, good I point. think that kind of summarizes pretty good the general guideline that we use. Um, yeah. If I'm starting to look into April now, what does your strength training look like? I circle back around because I know I've got April, May, June, July, and August. I'm going to circle back around to some higher repetition type stuff, but I'm going to incorporate some hiking. I will probably won't bust out the pack yet, at least not my, yeah. you know, RMEF pack. I'm going to, you know, if I got to do, what I'm just grab three, three or four hour, eh, four hours seems kind of long, maybe a two to three hour hike. I'll just use a day pack, fill it full of waters and maybe some food. Yeah, and uh, you know, Not, I like to do that at least once a week because I want to, I want to get out, I want to get out in the mountains. I want to see what's going on. I want to see if there's any animals moving. The snow's yeah. starting to melt off. I might grab a fly rod, bring it with me. Um, yeah, that's so. I'm going to start circling back around with the strength training, maybe some higher volume type stuff, which means higher reps, maybe a couple extra sets, un, uh, reduce the load a little bit, so back off on the weight. Um, you might even, you know, whatever. If you're going to go through a power phase. And um, you're going to train, I don't know, say five or maybe even six days a week. All right. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to cut it back maybe to three um, for this month and, and right. kind of transition, let yourself kind of <clears throat> recharge again. That That's yeah. what it would look like. Yeah. And I think that's, that's great. A lot of nuggets of information in there. And one of them that you touched on, which I think um, I kind of want to qualify just a little bit is you kind of talked about, you know, getting a pack out in the spring. Right. And I don't know if you're like me, but once I get to, 
you know, that off season period, uh, the postseason off season period or whatever, like I'm, I'm out on, on loading down on the pack during, during those months. Are you, are you the same with that? Because to me, yep. I'm going to spend that preseason period where I'm gradually working up some capacity to that. Obviously I'm going to spend most of the month of September with a pack on my back. And so I, I like to move entirely away from that for a while. And uh, is yep. that, is that your, your philosophy as well? Well, yeah, it, it, I do. And I, and I, and I like to do some hiking, trail running, uh, trail run walks type stuff. It's, it's kind of fun. So when the weather typically gets nice, specifically if you're in Colorado, it seems like May 1st, almost to the day, it starts to get nice. So, you, you know, you start getting antsy. You want to get out there and you want to see what's, see what's kind of going on in the, yeah. in the trails and in the woods a little bit. Um, I don't typically like to break out. I got a pair of lightweight hiking boots that I, that I do like to use and I'll use those to kind of cruise along, but I'm not putting on my, you know, my full on, you know, 10 inch high, you know, seasonal boots. I, I just don't yeah. like to do that that much in the summer, but I do like yeah. to wear them come August they're on. And I've yeah. loaded up to the point of, I got one heavy day on the pack and one lighter day. My heavy day is going to be up to 40 to 50 pounds. Um, whatever, say for four miles. And then my lighter day might even go a little bit longer, but my lighter pack somewhere between 20 and 30. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, and the recommendation seems to be a percentage of your, your body weight. And I think they're using, you know, yeah. up to 30%, which is a freaking ton. If you weigh yeah. 200 plus pounds, like I do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. it's taxing. I, I, it is very taxing. Yeah. And, and I think I, I, I want to spend, a lot of time talking about the the pack the rucking and all that that stuff um i, I think that you know we're just that that's kind of, we're kind of scratching that one right now but i think it's important yeah. just to bring it up within our programming which is guess what off season period put it away for a while right um yep. let's let's focus on the weight room let's focus on strength let's focus on all the stuff that's going to help kind of install or inlay some of the physical qualities that we want before we start putting load down on that spine, before we start trying to build up some resiliency to having that thing on for longer durations and higher loads and stuff like that. Um, it's just, again, things work cyclically and the better that we adhere to some of those things, a lot of times the better our response, especially from a body perspective is going to look like in terms of adapting to those things. And so, um, as you get into the summer, right, we're starting to get outside a little bit more. You kind of mentioned we're getting a little bit more into, uh, some trail stuff and things like that. Weight room wise, you said you're going to circle back right now. We're yeah. yes. I think a lot of times, especially if we think about the conversation, right? Some people probably are listening to that off season. You're like eight to 10 and maybe down to four. And you're like, yeah, but I'm, I'm going to be out there for hours. Right. Like I, I'm not ever going to do four reps. I'm going to do four reps like 400 times in a day. Right. Like speak <laughs> to why, why we circle back. And now it's like, yes, just just wait. Right. I hang in there because guess yeah. what? Now we have to broaden that envelope. Yes. Now we really have to try and expand the capacity from a strength endurance perspective. Um, what does your strength endurance stuff look like during that preseason period, like volumes and, and focus and stuff like that? Everything up to now has been really general. Now we start getting a little bit more specific. Yeah, I, I streamline a lot of the stuff. And to tell you the truth, I'll streamline a lot of the stuff just to let's just kind of break it down into, you know, I'm going to do some type of squat, squat variation, some type of press with a barbell, maybe some dumbbells and some type of pull. And I'm leaving off a lot. Um, I'm going to start yeah. to streamline that down. But if you like a, a time factor, if you're going to put in a, a pretty heavy strength training routine, let's compare it to something maybe you did in February. This is going to be. You know, that routine might ask, last for an hour and 10, hour and 15 in February. Now the, now the workout's going to last maybe 50 to 60 minutes. Um, I'm going to streamline some of the stuff. But I'll say this too, Joel. You know, and if you're a dude and you like the weight room and you want to do some curls and you want to do some dumbbell work and you want to crank up some arm work, go nuts. Have fun. I'll almost just pull that aside and be like, Let's just do an arm day on Friday, you know, arm farm. Good. Let's get into it. 
what are you going to do? I don't know. I'm going to make up as many different exercises until you can't brush your teeth. Um, why? Because it's fun. And I want big arms and I want veins and I want you to look good. I want you to feel confident. I'm down with all that. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, we, we don't have to we don't have to disregard the fact that um, I want to look good. I want to feel good. Um, and I like doing arms because it's kind of yeah. fun. Look so, good, feel good, play good, right? And we always used, I'm okay we with that. Say that. Yeah. I, I, I always talk about that within training, there is a balance to those things, which is sometimes you have to give them a little bit of what they want to get what you want, right? And so right. I'm definitely not opposed to mixing in some stuff that maybe, you know, right. keeps them stimulated, keeps them excited, right? And make sure that you're not just so myopically driven by your program goals that you don't keep in mind that like, I think a big part, an example that I gave in episode one, which was talking about uh, a buddy of mine who did, did a, you know, a, a training cycle with one of the, you know, kind of we'll call it known entities within the the hunting community and he's like man i just i felt so beat up and it was just i got to the point where i didn't feel good um i was working extremely hard and i'm like this isn't, this is not, this is not what I want. Right. And again, I'm all, I'm all for like building some mental durability and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, to my point is there also has to be a portion of this, which is, I want you to want to train. I want you to enjoy training. And yes, guess what? I, I want it. It's going to be hard. There's going to be times when this is going to, you know, there's going to be a bucket of suck it, but I don't ever want you to like, look at your clock, look at your calendar, look at your watch and go like, Oh my God, I got to go train today. This is going to be terrible. Yeah. And if, yeah, guess you, what? You, you, attrition rates going to go way up. And that's, that's what I was going to get at. I couldn't agree more. And if you're just kind of demotivated to train, like occasionally that's going to happen. You, you know, you got too much going on or whatever it is, but um, you shouldn't chronically feel like, Oh, the drudgery of working out is no, I want to have fun. That, that might be uh, yeah for me the most yeah. important thing yeah uh, there's there's some interesting stuff that goes along with that I know that we've talked about uh, you know you have like runners high you've got you know the endorphin kind of piece of yeah. what what training will do and and there's some extreme stuff right like we've actually you know a, a, someone that I will leave unnamed but you and I know very well that's very prominent has been for decades in the research community is done some interesting stuff on what you know some of this like extreme high intensity stuff looks like and what it does to us in terms of uh, we see it fanatically right in the crossfit community and stuff like that where guess what like there there can be some some downfalls to those things that borderline some addiction and some stuff that isn't healthy Right. Yeah. And it, it's you got to find a balance in here that uh, keeps the, the, the fire stoked without necessarily pushing them so far over the edge where you're like, whoa, 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 e, you know, hold, hold on there. Like, yeah. more, more is not always better. Right. Um, yeah. So yeah, motiv motivation but, for some is not the issue. That's for certain. Right, right, exactly. And and that's where I think you run into some issues with some of the stuff where people become fanatical, right? We've all probably ran into those people and you're like, yeah, that's, that's good. And uh, I love the motivation, but there's also a, a point of that that does not become a positive correlator with training as well. So um, interesting to, to think about. Now, I've got a couple notes here right now. We've, we've, we're kind of getting closer to, to our uh, the start line of what would be the finish of our preparation, right? The start line of the hunting season, the finish line of our preparation. But I want to talk a little bit about uh, some other things that I kind of had written down here. Number one is I want to talk about planes of motion real quickly, because I think this is a big one. Uh, some of, I'm not talking about these planes. I'm talking about planes of motion. We're talking about how do we set up training? You've mentioned squat, you've mentioned deadlift, you've mentioned, you know, some things. And I am a huge believer that if your entire workout exists in a hallway, meaning that everything is here and here, here and here, and we don't do anything 
training wise in variation, right? Directional lunging, crossover stuff, moving laterally, that type of thing. Um, that's also potentially, you know, where I think the specific part as we get into preseason has to become a, a priority. Do you prioritize that as well? I'm assuming. Well, yeah, now's the time to do it too. So we can take this in a lot of different, different directions here. So the planes of motion, there's frontal, sagittal, and transverse. Um, mechanically, that's kind of how the body is uh, evaluated. However, if you look at uh, what the nature of hiking off trail, specifically in the West with downfall, um, you're going to make a lot of weird movements. And, yeah. you know, external rotation at the hip, up lateral movements, adduction, abduction, um, you know, specifically around the lower body is is going to be key. Um, the ankle has some issues there when you're off trail. There's always that um, misstep where you're thinking, man, I didn't I didn't see that rock there or I didn't see that hole or else, you know, I, I took a step across that creek and, you know, I darn near rolled my ankle and you throw on a pack and then the mechanics change up even more. So um, yeah. I think there's some orthopedic issues there. There's some. Uh, you know, neuromuscular issues there as well. Is your body used to that type of stuff? And yeah. if, if, um, if you're not used to it, you should try to get off, uh, you know, off trail a little bit too. So I guess yeah. now what we can do in the weight room there, there's a lot of different directions. Um, the balance issue, which you already kind of mentioned, um, yeah. I like to do some balance issues with folks. I think a lot of it stems back from, um, geez, I'm losing my balance as I get older. I'm not nearly as stable as I used to. And if you look at the correlation between strength and balance, I, I think there's you're going to see a lot of you know direct correlation between those two kind of causation as well. Yeah. So I never get too far away from that strength, but I do want to do some ankle strengthening. I want to do some balance specifically designed for the hip and knee in particular. And, and if you look at people that are losing their balance, they're losing their center of gravity, it's outside of the base of support and their hips aren't going to be in the, uh, the correct position. So yeah, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I want to address in the way. Yeah. So just real quick so that people understand. So Mike, Mike threw out a couple of terms there, sagittal, frontal and transverse in terms of planes. Right. And, and as I mentioned, most of our workouts, typically, re, you know, kind of reside around the sagittal plane. The sagittal plane is going to be your squat. It's going to be your deadlift. It's going to be your bench press. It's going to be your shoulder press. It's like I said, anything that is essentially here and here, right? And what I mentioned is diversifying. So frontal plane is going to be moving left and right. It's going to be doing lateral lunging. It's going to be doing uh, things that are out and away from our body, which as, as Mike mentioned, right, like getting our foot outside of where our center of mass is. Um, we get to see a lot of that stuff when we think about contouring, right, where our foot is outside of our hip, we're pushing and kind of driving ourselves uh, uphill and, and those types of things. And then the transverse plane is anything that requires rotation, right? So we think about things that we reach for and grasp or flex and rotate and those types of things. And that's where uh, I said, to me, if we want to build better resiliency to getting folks to handle the contouring, the uphill, the downhill, the weird steps, the, the rotations and doing all that stuff, especially thinking about the addition of the pack and the load, the emphasis of those things in the demand even makes that much, much higher. So when we start getting into the preseason, we get away from these traditional movements of just being up and down to a lot more single leg, a lot more split stance stuff, a lot more directional lunging. Uh, I do things at 45s and drop steps and crossovers and our step ups and things like that become a lot more diversified. In fact, I can provide a link up here to what we call our side hill series. And we'll actually put people where their foot is going to be inverted we're going to put their foot everted we're going to put their foot downhill as they do some lunging things because you know you and i are lucky we can go out and head up to the hills and be there in 15 minutes mm -hmm. and, and start putting ourselves in that environment but if you're from missouri or you know 
wherever else, you know, that maybe is, is a lot more flat land, you may have to simulate some of these things in training. And that series is a really good one to kind of show you like, okay, how can I prep that foot a little bit? How can I ensure that I, I get myself into some little bit more realistic positions that I might have to account for when I get out there? And, and um, those are those are ways where, you know, we're trying to create maybe some hacks for you, if you will, that uh, can can prepare you better right because if you don't got the mountain guess what you better find a way to at least simulate some things that might help you when you get there smart for sure yeah so the I, last you know thing too, go ahead joe I was, I was gonna say too i wouldn't i would probably you can run that up until about june and then it start you're going to start incorporating some of those more specific um you know mountain specific yeah. type actions for sure for sure yeah, most definitely. Um, the last thing you and I, we, we kind of finished with talking about this right before we started the podcast, which was, let's talk a little bit about shoulder considerations. Um, you know, yes, we're going to go through all of our strength stuff. We're going to, you know, push and pull and do all kinds of things with, with upper body and whatnot. But we, we tend to see some things that get specific to shoulder work we know how important that is number one i think about it from a rucking perspective sometimes right we spend a lot of time kind of rounded and, and loaded down and we have to think about training and getting people back to more neutral positions but especially when we talk about archery right we're talking about the integrity of the shoulder the ability to pull that bow um, i watched a video the other day and like i, I saw a guy and he was walking a tree line there was some elk coming out and the guy grabs his bow and he goes and does oh. one of these mm. and, and i'm like <laughs> you better either hit the weight room or check your poundage because uh, that much movement for me uh, you know is is probably punting out of my coverage a little bit because if i got to move that much to get to a draw we need to we need to maybe focus on some things in terms of strength or shoulder qualities um so let, let's talk a little bit about that what things now that we're talking more specifically do you focus on in terms of shoulder health shoulder integrity stability you know that type of stuff well full disclosure um a couple things one that sky pull is just it doesn't look cool i i don't like it <laughs> It drives me nuts. Like I, I was watching yeah. the video and all of a sudden, you know, I'm like, oh man, like they're, they're literally like just, it was elk, 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 elk. Right. And all of a sudden I see this guy like reach to the heavens and I'm like, oh my gosh, like, what are right. we doing here? Like, he's I know. back there, Tex. <laughs> he just embarrassed. There's got to be a word that where you embarrass yourself and you don't know yeah. it. It's, it's yeah. like, dude, oh my God, man, that just looks like you are so weak. You or or, there's the, or the, there's the other guy that wiggles his way where he keeps it in here, right? And he goes, oh, I know. Right? And and they drop. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, oh, yeah. man, you just got to do a bunch of dumbbell rows and it's really going to help. Yeah. So the other thing is I've had two shoulder surgeries um, on my right shoulder, rotator cuff twice. Uh, they had to cut it and reattach it. Bicep tendon had to cut it, reattach it. Um, and they had to shave off some... Um, bone spurs on there too. So I'm very familiar with, um, you know, the rotator cuff and how it works and scapular stabil stabilizers, winging of the, um, the scapula as well. Impingement, it's all kind of this right. syndrome um, that, that needs to be addressed. And my mechanism was I threw a football, you know, when I was back in the NFL to a, for a lot of years, um, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to throw it accurately and, you know, in the off season. So you do end up throwing a lot of footballs that took a lot of damage there. And then, yeah. you know, years of heavy strength training, powerlifting, Olympic weightlifting, it's, you know, it's, it took its toll on me. So yeah. um, it had to be repaired. I, All that I thought said, you were talking about me. <laughs> it will right. be this torn and this is that with scapulas <laughs> winging and i'm like hey why are you making fun of me here <laughs> so i'm fighting um, i'm fighting off two surgeries that's what i've been doing to, yeah. trying to make trying to work on these qualities that we're talking about here is is, is my, Let my me tell you, what's going to happen joel you're going to wake up one day and you're going to say it's time and i held it off as long as i possibly could 
And yeah. it had been about a year and a half. And I said, all right, today's the day. I got to get it done. Um, so at any rate, um, yeah. So flexibility around the shoulder. Listen to your shoulders. They'll tell you a lot. Um, take time off if you need to. And if you've got a movement that is uh, suspect, uh, specifically on the bicep tendon, the incline press is notorious um, to put a lot of pressure on that bicep tendon. Um, that, that can lead to problems, especially if you're very determined not to give up some exercises that are very punishing. Right. Um, so, you know, flexibility around the area, some strengthening around the area. Um, I, I've got, you know, a series of exercises that I like to do specifically for, um, archery, um, around the rotator cuff and it helps I don't know if you can kind of see it. It helps keep that impingement. I'm going to pull that humerus down and back, and that will help create space underneath the right. AC joint so the rotator can, cuff can operate as opposed to coming up and squeezing and grinding away, especially if you got a bone spur. So For all sure. part of the aging process, I put it off as long as I can. Internal external rotation, pull through scapular stabilization type movements, rowing type movements. And like you said, to get that full protraction into retraction, very important. And that's proper exercise yeah. technique, one of our pillars yeah. that we talked about last time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that that's that's really important. Um, I, I think because when you, you look at people, right, like a lot, of, I know folks will ask me, uh, you know, how much do you shoot and that type of stuff. And, and I usually have a target when we look at say like total archery challenge, for example, and I say, I'm going to try to get to where, you know, I'm 500 to a thousand, you know, maybe arrows if I can, usually by, by total archery challenge, I'm, I'm like 500, right? Uh, it, I, do the best I can to get out and shoot as much as possible. I'm not someone who's going to go out and shoot a hundred arrows a day. And that's mainly based on just time and availability and that type of stuff. But to me, when you think about the number of reps, right, is you're talking about repetition, you're talking about the possibility of overuse. And if you're doing those things where again, you're like compensating to try and like figure out how to get that thing back there every single one of those reps that you do pulling that bow back is going to further be facilitating dysfunction and so again when we talk about going into the weight room mike mentioned you know doing external rotation with bands internal rotation with bands we do some things with you know scaption thumbs down thumbs up right yep. cable Same. i'm a big big fan of right like if i'm going to work on you know improving that anchor point and stuff like that we'll do some rows where you know i'm doing face pulls whether they're this way singularly or whatever using a trx or a cable and try to create better integrity through there. Um, I know we, you and I kind of were talking a little bit about this. What's your thoughts? Because I know um, there's, you know, some folks that have a school of thought of doing like, you know, extended holds with a, with a band or doing like, you know, weighting that front arm to improve stability, right? I know I'm kind of, you know, lobbing this one in your court. Like, what's your thoughts or feelings on some of that stuff? Do you feel like there's a place for that? Do you think it's effective? Like, do you do some other things differently to address that? Well, if we look at it from a sports performance type of model, we have our general strength, and then we have a specific strength. And, um, you know, and if you're, if you have your general strength to the point of competency and, and whatever that is for you, you we both pull 70 pound bowls bows Point which isn't too like heavy that. yeah yeah that's really specific that is as specific as you can get however when you let that bow back down you're getting the e-center contraction so right. i know it's a pull up drop the shoulder place your shoulder blades together easy release pull through which we all know that's fine. At the end of like when I go to shoot, specifically specifically in the off season, sometime in the spring and summer, I'm starting to pull my bow back ten times next to the truck, just to get that specific motion and anchor. Okay, great. But I think if you don't have that general strength, and then you want to get into some specific type movements, whatever those may be, there's a few of them out there from our colleagues. Um, don't forget about the general strength and. Yeah. I'm just, you know, whatever. And if I can, if I can row 
um, hundred pound dumbbell or 80, 80 to hundred pound dumbbell for six reps as a guy that wants to pull back a 70 pound bow, do that with proper exercise technique. Great. You're there. Okay. Now yeah. maybe to work on some of that specificity, specificity. However, we've also seen older shooters, excellent, excellent with the bow that aren't that strong, but they have that stability and the motor control. It's like, right. well, this person has never done any of those exercises and they're, you know, punching bullet holes at 20 and 30 yards or maybe even longer. And like, huh, well, they're really good at shooting their bow. Is, is that right. what that is? Um, yeah. You know, to kind of hold it to, I, you know, you definitely want to hold your bow, though, up to, you know, you hold your bow for 20 or 30 seconds in the off season. It seems like an eternity and it, yeah. it burns. So to hold yeah. your bow for a minute. Holy cow. If I can get if I can get up to the point where I can hold my bow and have some type of stability for a minute good on me yeah Comes most definitely yeah and i think it, it goes along the lines of of understanding the pro, you know the process which is starting with what we talked about come october october into december and january starting to transition into the spring right all of those things that you do yeah. in those months to build up in terms of building general strength increasing that to you know having some power and and then starting to build up some endurance as we start getting into the preseason like all of those things are going to hopefully afford you the ability to not be this guy right like and yeah. and that the shoulder qualities of some of these things that become specific right rotator cuff work and stuff like that like those can be sprinkled in throughout all of those periods depending upon you know if you have no shoulder issues they're a good yep. idea to do once or twice a week right if you do have shoulder issues Absolutely. right i've yeah. got two torn labrums right my this shoulder here I, I tore a bicep and guess what that's that's my draw arm I make sure that I'm constantly doing things to focus on not only the integrity of the shoulder, the strength of the shoulder, all of those basic things that are going to help me improve my ability to continue pulling back that bow without being that guy, right? And um, guess what? Still successful at that. I, hopefully tomorrow is not my day. I wake up, like you said, and go, uh, today's the day. Um, all the yeah, timing you know. and all that. Yeah, you'll know. But um <laughs> All, all really awesome stuff, Mike. Uh, this kind of starts to set the table, right? We still have a ton of things to talk about. We're going to get into nutrition. We're going to talk about altitude specifics. We're going to talk about a whole host of other things that that we're just starting to scratch the surface for. But this this is this is the foundation, right? Like we're putting down the bricks in the house that help us now start to build our way up. And and as I say a lot of times when we talk about our programming, is try to keep in mind that that is what is going to serve you the best over the long haul, right? If we get to all this like cute and sexy stuff and whatever else, and we don't focus on that foundation first, then you're going to find probably time and time again, setbacks, injuries, you know, downfalls within, you know, how you feel when you get out into the backwoods and that type of stuff. So this is a really good place for this to start. Um, any, anything else you want to add before we kind of, put a bow on this one? Well, just, just one thing, you know, I get, I mean, we've talked about this offline too. It's, it's not, we being in our background in strength and conditioning, this is where we want to meet our hunting experience. And it, it's not right or wrong. It, it's just that I think that with people that enjoy exercise and they see the challenges of backcountry hunting and hiking, um, and then you kind of intersect those two passions together. And this is kind of where we meet the road. Yeah, a hundred percent. So, uh, good, good stuff, Mike. Appreciate the insight. This is getting fun. Uh, I'm, I'm like hanging on to the reins cause I know there's uh, so many things that we still are going to put out there. Yeah. If you have questions, please be sure to leave them in the comment section. We want to make sure that we interact, that we, if there's anything, terms or concepts or things like that, that maybe we threw out there that kind of flew by you or you want more elaboration on, we're going to try and make sure that we also provide some of those links to some of those research pieces and stuff like that, that Mike touched on so that you see where this information's coming from. And uh, I'm, I'm excited about the next one already. So we appreciate you Me guys too. tuning in. 
Yeah, we appreciate you guys tuning in today. Mike, thanks for all your time and input, and uh, I'm pumped for, for the next one. We'll get that one dialed in, and we'll see you guys next time. Thanks, Coach. Appreciate you.